Good evening. My name is Catherine Gedek Soltis, and I have the privilege of directing the Center for Peace and Justice Education here at Villanova University. I want to warmly welcome you all to tonight's presentation of the 2021 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. With this award, we annually recognize outstanding contributions to the understanding of the meaning and conditions for justice and peace in human communities. Our 2021 award winner, the Poor People's Campaign, now joins the ranks of esteemed past recipients, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Sister Helen Prejean, Lema Bowie, Las Patronas, Father Greg Boyle, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, and Brian Stevenson. Before we begin, a few quick notes. First, we will be recording this event. We are recording this event, and we'll be making it available on our website, the Center for Peace and Justice Education's website, uh, in a few minutes, or a few days, and once all gets processed. Second, we ask that you submit your questions after the remarks using the Q&A feature. The chat has been disabled. And we will get to as many questions as we can this evening before we conclude. Third and finally, some notes of thanks. I'd like to thank members of the Villanova University Peace Award Committee, including its chair, Tim Horner, for their work to bring the Poor People's Campaign to this moment. And I'd like to express my gratitude to the amazing faculty and staff of the Center for Peace and Justice Education, especially Katie Linehan, who worked a great deal to bring us together this evening and make this happen. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleague, Reverend Naomi Washington Liebhart, who will be formally introducing our award recipient and speakers in a moment. Reverend Liebhart is the Director for Faith-Based and Interfaith Affairs for the City of Philadelphia. And she is also adjunct professor here at Villanova for theology and religious studies, as well as for peace and justice. She has been included in the Route 100, an annual list of the nation's most influential African Americans, ages 25 to 45. And she recently received the Philadelphia Tribune's Women of Achievement Award. We are so fortunate that she is part of our community. And I turn to her now so she can share with you about the Poor People's Campaign this incredible organization and the two incredible people who are behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gedek Soltis, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm gonna to share a little bit with you about the Poor People's Campaign and our co-chairs in just a moment. But you know, one of the things I love about the Poor People's Campaign is the proof is in the work. And so we're gonna watch a brief video now that tells you a little bit more about the work of the Poor People's Campaign. I'll share my screen and let's watch together. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. At one time, poverty was a temporary condition. You were on a down slope for a minute, but you could bounce back up. We can't bounce back up today. It's permanent. We're not going back to the factory and building cars and trucks like we once did. A job working at McDonald's or the grocery store doesn't pay enough for one person to live. We work a 40-hour work week, still not enough. Living from paycheck to paycheck. Rent is $600 a month. We got water bill, electricity. I do this for my kids. And, and it hurts. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am a working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. We were in the height of mass water shutoffs. This entire neighborhood um, was shut off all at one time. I saw all my neighbors get shut off right in front of me. It was kind of terrifying. I'm 42 years old, and I'm a cashier at McDonald's. I had lost my house. 
you're welcome to come inside. There's a lot of people that are living in their cars. You never notice until you're in the same situation. So I have stuff to give my children. I'm paying all these bills, and they need school clothes and stuff, so they be asking me for I can't get to them. Now I'm a Kansas farmer's wife. Kansas farmers are committing suicide. Why? They're usually in debt, up to their eyeballs. I see poverty in my own community. You know, there's a 70% unemployment rate in my in the reservation right now. Here in New York City, we're home to millionaires and billionaires, and we have so many people living in the street, and that's just not right. I've been a uh, homeless veteran twice, uh, lived in a shelter. I've been living down here since I was 17. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. 700,000 people in this country are on the verge of losing their food stamps. This budget calls for shrinking the social safety net programs like Medicare. I just know that everything that's happening to us isn't right. I'm in stage five of kidney disease. I fell behind on my health care and they canceled my health insurance and they told me uh, I have to wait until open enrollment. There's only five stages of kidney disease and I'm in the fifth stage. Murder, it's murder, you know, if you ask me, it's murder. I lost a son to gun violence. And I lost a daughter. No parents should have, in America, should have to bury their pet, their child for lack of medical expense. I'm willing because my children my God. are no more. I want you to know that when hands that once picked cotton join hands of Latinos, join hands of progressive whites, join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and Native American hands and poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands, when we all get together, we are an instrument of redemption. When we join hands, we can revive and make sure that the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law is never taken away from anybody. So I got a question. Are the rejected ready to revive and declare that this land is your land, this land is my land, this land is our land. And together, from the State House to the White House, the rejected are going to demand that this nation never give up on being one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Founded by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. over 50 years ago, the Poor People's Campaign continues to call for a moral revival in America by lifting up the voices of people experiencing poverty and addressing the interlocking systems of racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the economy. Tonight, we especially welcome the Reverend Dr. William Barber and the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who are here tonight to accept the Peace Award on behalf of the Poor People's Campaign. The Poor People's Campaign has been working for a moral revival in America by confronting the many overlapping crises and systems that feed into poverty, injustice, and inequality. 
By mobilizing poor and impacted people, as well as moral witnesses committed to a moral agenda, the campaign speaks out with the voices of people experiencing poverty and injustice. They have named and claimed this time in our nation as a critical juncture, a time of danger, as well as opportunity, a time when we can use our voices to change the moral narrative. To borrow Reverend Dr. Barber's own words, now, quote, it's time to believe again. It's time to believe the heart and soul of this democracy can live. With every breath we have, while we still have time, together, let's rise up and do more to build a one true America that works for all of us. So through rallies and actions and contact with politicians at all levels of our government, the Poor People's Campaign has worked tirelessly to promote a moral agenda in our country that will strengthen and empower poor and impacted people. The Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, is also the director of the Cairo Center for Religion, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary, where she also teaches. Reverend Dr. Theo Harris is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, as well as the author of Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor, and co-author of Revive Us Again, Vision and Action in Moral Organizing. She's also the editor of We Cry Justice, Reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. Over the past few years, Reverend Dr. Theo Harris has been honored with the Hunger Leadership Award from the Congressional Hunger Center, along with the Reverend Dr. William Barber II. A Woman of Faith Award she has received from the Presbyterian Church USA. And in 2019, she was a Selma Bridge Award recipient. She's been named one of 15 faith leaders to watch by the Center for American Progress, one of 11 women shaping the church by Sojourners, and one of the political 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries whose ideas are driving politics. Reverend Dr. Theo Harris received her BA in Urban Studies from the University of Pennsylvania, go Penn Quakers, my alma mater, and her MDiv from Union Theological Seminary. And she also received her PhD at Union in New Testament and Christian origins. In addition to being a co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Bishop William Barber II is also a pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church and the president and senior lecturers of Repairers of the Breach. He also spearheaded the Forward Together Moral Movement and its Moral Monday protests, which have been relaunched with the Poor People's Campaign. Bishop Barber is the author of four books, We Are Called to Be a Movement, Revive Us Again, Vision and Action in Moral Organizing, The Third Reconstruction, Moral Mondays, Fusion Politics and the Rise of a New Justice Movement, and Forward Together, A Moral Message for the Nation. Reverend Dr. Barber is a prolific speaker and has given hundreds of keynote addresses at national and state conferences. He delivered the homily for the 59th inaugural prayer service for President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on January 21st, 2021. Reverend Dr. Barber spoke at the fifth UNI Global Union World Congress, addressing over 25 countries. He is a visiting professor of public theology and activism at Union Theological Seminary, a senior fellow at Auburn Seminary, and is regularly featured by national news outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, The New York Times, Washington Post, and The Nation magazine. He spoke at the Vatican in 2017 in response to Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. And just last month, Bishop Barber returned to Rome for a conference on ending poverty at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Bishop Barber has also served as the president of the North Carolina NAACP 
and has served on the National NAACP Board of Directors. He has been added to the Black Achievers Wall in the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, England. Reverend Dr. Barber has been named one of 2020's BET 100 Entertainers and Innovators as a social justice warrior. He's also received the North Carolina Award, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Award, and the Puffin Award. In addition to being a former Mel King Fellow at MIT and a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award recipient, Reverend Dr. Barber has also had 10 honorary degrees conferred upon him. I just wanna personally say that I first met Bishop Barber at a Community Investment Network Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina, 13 years ago in 2008. I wasn't a minister then, I wasn't a professor then, but I was interested in leveraging Black dollars and Black brilliance to heal and strengthen Black communities. And Bishop Barber gave the keynote address. Came full circle 10 years later in 2018, when I was ordained together with my spouse and Bishop William Barber preached the service. I stood with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries when he was consecrated to the office of Bishop by Bishop Yvette Flunder, who is my spiritual mentor and pastor. The campaign's ongoing mission to address the interlocking systems perpetuating poverty and oppression and call for a moral revival is no less than a call for each person to take a prophetic stance together to transform our country's war economy into a peace economy. To quote Reverend Dr. Theo Harris, it's times like these when prophets have to arise to sound the alarm, cry out, somebody is hurting our people. Somebody is evicting our families. Somebody is suppressing our votes, but we won't be silent anymore. In times like these, it is our privilege here at Villanova to honor the heroic work of the Poor People's Campaign to which both Reverend Dr. Barber and Reverend Dr. Theo Harris have contributed so greatly. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Father Kevin DePrenzio of Villanova's Vice President for Mission and Ministry. And Father Kevin is going to present the 2021 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award on behalf of the university. Father Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Father Peter regrets that he cannot be with us tonight as he is traveling, but he sends his prayers, congratulations, and good wishes uh, to our recipients this evening. After such a heartfelt and compelling introduction from Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart, it is quite clear how and why the award committee discerned tonight's recipient. The hard and essential work of exposing the interlocking of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the economy amplifies the cries of the most vulnerable within our human and earth community. Echoing the gospel mandate, those with ears ought to hear. And so, because of its outstanding contributions to the understanding of the meaning and conditions for justice and peace in human communities, the Villanova University community proudly presents the 2021 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award to the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Drs. Liz Theo Harris and William Barber accepting the award on behalf of the campaign. Thank you so much. It's powerful to be with you all. Thank you to Dr. Catherine Gedick Solsis, the director of the Center for Peace and Justice Education, Father Kevin DiPrinzio, Vice President for Mission and Ministry, Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart, the amazing moderator of this evening, and to all the students, faculty, staff, administration of Villanova University, everyone behind the scenes this evening, and to that awards committee. Uh, for deciding to bestow us with this beautiful honor. 
It is indeed an honor to receive this award in the company of so many amazing activists and advocates dedicated to peace and justice over the years. Archbishop Tutu, Father Gregory Boyle, Brian Stevenson, the late Representative John Lewis, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers Network, the Catholic Worker Movement, so many beautiful justice makers in our world today. We, with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, receive this award on behalf of hundreds of thousands of poor and low-income leaders, clergy, activists, and advocates who have come together in nearly every state across the country, people of all races and ages and creeds from dozens of national faith bodies representing hundreds and hundreds of organizations to build the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. I was raised in a family that was very active in the peace and justice movement who appreciated the values embedded in a Jesuit education, who followed the words of the Reverend Dr. King that peace is not just the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And it is the framework of peace and justice that we receive from Dr. King and so many who've come before us in the freedom movement. They wanna share a little bit more with you this evening. Back in 1968, for six weeks in the late spring, thousands of poor people occupied the Washington Mall in an encampment known as Resurrection City. Two months earlier, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been murdered on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel while he was in Memphis for a sanitation workers strike. By then, King had been on the road for months building support for the Poor People's Campaign, an escalated project of nonviolent civil disobedience intended to make the national crisis of poverty visible and indisputable. On June 19, 1968, two days before police raided and destroyed Resurrection City, tens of thousands of poor people marched to the Lincoln Memorial for the Solidarity Day rally. It was also Juneteenth, the historic day in 1865 when enslaved people in the far reaches of the defeated Confederacy learned that they had been emancipated. The weight of distant and near history hung heavy, but hopeful as speakers considered the country as it was and as it could be. Coretta Scott King spoke with a particular clarity of a widow unwilling to fall into the trap of a personal debate on the violence done just to her family, entirely committed as she was to uprooting the evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. She reminded the nation that it was host to deeper, more devastating forms of violence. She said that very day, in this society, Violence against poor people and minority groups is routine. I remind you that starving a child is violence. Suppressing a culture is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her child is violence. Discrimination against a working man is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical need is violence. Contempt of poverty is violence. Even the lack of willpower to help humanity is a sick and sinister form of violence. The words of Coretta Scott King were a significant corrective to the national discourse of her day. Amid this social upheaval, Coretta Scott King insisted on a different starting place for understanding violence, the mass suffering that swirled around her, in just a few sentences, she clarified an entire political and strategic worldview, one that her husband had named in the Beyond Vietnam sermon a year to the day of his assassination. The state and its apparatuses were the purveyors of a most extraordinary form of violence, sometimes directly, but often through aggressive policies that separated people from the basic resources necessary to sustain life. Things like housing, 
health care, wages, and education. She clarified that for every bullet and baton, there was a piece of legislation, a government program that normalized poverty and proliferated death. This, she explained, was what violence looked like at a society-wide level. Its opposite was what she and countless others had long been fighting for, a nation that could feed, house, educate, and provide for absolutely every person. In 2018, 50 years after the rise and fall of Resurrection City and the death of Dr. King, we in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, helped to launch a new organizing project through the largest coordinated wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century. Over six weeks between Mother's Day and the summer solstice, people in more than 35 states flooded state capitals in Washington, D.C. We took over legislative buildings, government offices, public space, sometimes in cities and capitals that had never experienced such activity. The aim was to break through the moral narrative of a nation by dramatizing the injustices of policy violence and the great contradiction of poverty amidst plenty to lay the early groundwork for a national movement that could galvanize people into long-term action. Across the country, people felt the midnight stirrings of a sleeping giant. Tens of thousands showed up in support, many who had spent their whole lives organizing and many more who were being politicized for the first time. Together, we founded this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And over the past two and a half years, we've built coordinating committees of poor and dispossessed people, moral leaders, advocates, activists in 45 states. We've met with tens of thousands of people chronicling their demands for a better society. We've spent time in my home state of Wisconsin, where the safety net has been shredded over the past decade. Families are going without heat and electricity, even in cold winters. We've been in Lowndes County, Alabama, where families have no access to sanitation services, living with raw sewage in their yards, precipitating a healthcare crisis where tropical diseases are showing up in the rural South. Cross at Arkansas, where a whole town was poisoned by a paper and chemical and plywood plant, grandparents meet their grandchildren 80 miles outside of town to protect them from the toxins. It includes Pacoima, California, where one in four children at Telfair Elementary School are homeless, mostly native and indigenous kids. And Altoona, Pennsylvania, where children are being taken away from their parents because they can't afford to pay their water, utilities, or rent. From our inception, this campaign has been grounded in what we call fusion politics. We understand that the poor have not only long been unorganized, but purposely disorganized through divide and conquer strategies, structures of violence, dehumanization like white supremacy, systemic racism, all forms of prejudice and hate. We also believe that poor people of all backgrounds can come together, are coming together to organize on the basis of shared conditions and interests because it's happened throughout history We've seen it in our work today. In fact, we hold that the unity of the poor is a path to a genuine era of human rights, as Dr. King once imagined. This idea of fusion politics itself echoes earlier chapters of political reckoning and transformation in this country. From Reconstruction after the Civil War through the, 19, through the 1880s and 1890s, newly emancipated Black people built powerful if fragile alliances with poor whites to seize governing power. Fusion parties expanded voting rights, access to public education, labor protections, fair taxation, and more all across the South. In North Carolina, they went so far as to rewrite the state constitution in 1868, codifying the rights of all to life, liberty, and the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor. Fast forward to today, before COVID hit, there were 140 million poor and low-income people. 140 million people who are poor or one healthcare crisis, one job loss, one, one small emergency, one storm 
from absolute economic ruin. Consider these facts. 43.5% of Americans are poor or low income. That includes 39 million children, 24 million black people, 38 million Latinos, 2 million indigenous people, 8 million Asians, and 66 million poor white people. More than half of our kids live in poverty or in food insecure households. The US spends 53 cents of every discretionary dollar on the military and less than 15 cents on education, healthcare, anti-poverty programs combined. And pollution caused 9 million deaths last year. There are 4 million American families that were exposed to unsafe drinking water. But as my co-chair, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II says often, we can't just curse the darkness. We must shine a light on what's possible, an agenda to heal the nation. So drawing from this history and from our deep engagement with poor communities across the country, we've developed a moral agenda. And it's focused on eliminating the evils of systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy and militarism. The agenda includes living wages and guaranteed income, universal health care and free college and university. It puts forward bold de demands about immigrant rights, voting rights, women's rights, LGBTQIA rights, the rights and sovereignty of native and indigenous people and so much more. In our work, many people tell us we're being far too ambitious, that our demands are politically impossible and too expensive, but this is just not true. The benefits of an agenda like this far outweigh the costs. It, in fact, it's costing our society a trillion dollars a year to have so many kids in poverty. The cost of continuing immoral policies, misguided priorities, that's what we can't afford. In the Poor People's Campaign, we assert that we need a moral revolution of values that places the needs and priorities of the poor and the planet at the heart of our budget, at the center of our national discourse, at the core of our structures and policies. This will create more jobs, build up infrastructure, strengthen our economy, protect our resources for future generations. This will redound to the benefit of all instead of a select few. There's a saying, it's that when you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. We know this from economics and social science, but also from the Bible. In Deuteronomy, it says that if you forgive debts, increase programs that lift up the poor. If you pay your workers a living wage, release those who are oppressed to inequality, lend out money knowing you'll never get paid back. When you welcome the immigrant and you are stewards of the earth, then your whole nation will flourish. God does not ordain poverty. The poor will only be with us as long as we are disobedient to God. Poverty is people's creation. It's the creation of immoral budgets, unjust policies, and we can choose to end it. And so I come this evening with a particular scripture from Jeremiah on my heart. Jeremiah 6 reads, my people are broken shattered and they put on band-aid saying it's not so bad you'll be just fine but things are not just fine do you suppose they are embarrassed over this outreach no they have no shame indeed too many of our religious and political leaders today are ignoring the fierce urgency of now committing a crime the prophets have denounced throughout our ages and so we the remnant, those who can see further and feel deeper, those that are gathered here this evening, we who reject the lie of scarcity, who know that it is possible to fully address racism and poverty, we are compelled to stand up, to proclaim that these bones must live, to cry out, I choose to heal, to raise our hand and answer the question, I will stand in the gap. To say I lived at a time when people had raw sewage in their yards, and folks were homeless, kids being taken away, and I linked arms with others and acted for justice. So this evening, as I help to receive this award, I'm here also to invite 
everybody gathered to join this campaign, to join our moral uprising, to have faith that we can take action together because we are a new and unsettling force and we are powerful and, and we're here. We must come together and sing out that song in that introduction. Somebody is hurting our people. It's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. And I wanna encourage you all, everybody you know, some people you might be able to meet as you mobilize and organize and register and educate and engage people to converge, to convene for a mass poor people's assembly, low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington that we're holding on June 18th, 2022. We must make a declaration. Racism and poverty are not inevitable. We can make a difference. We can make a change. Thank you so much for this honor. Let us continue the struggle. Thank you so much, Reverend Theo Harris. Um, your words and your witness are so inspiring and so deeply needed right now. Uh, right now in the program is the moment that we were going to introduce to you, Reverend William Barber II. I am not William Barber, as you can tell. And I am disappointed to tell you that he is not able to join us this evening. We've just been in contact with uh, folks he's working with, and we understand that there was an action today uh, as part of this important campaign. And um, we know that some people were taken into custody. We don't know um, the status, uh, but we know that it, there was some upheaval today. And so um, we are not able to reach William Barber directly at this moment, and he's not able to be with us. However, you know you give the peace award to the right person when they're too busy doing the work to be here to get the award. <laughs> um, and so uh, this evening, I hope that you all came to this event because you knew how important the work of the Poor People's Campaign is and that you knew that you needed to be invited into that work. And so you didn't come here just to hear people speak. You came here to be inspired, to be challenged, and to be encouraged. And we have all that we need to do that tonight. We have heard in these words from Reverend Theo Harris, as she has taken the scripture and brought it into 2021, into the streets, into the cities, into our neighborhoods all around this country, the deep pain and the needs and, and the call for us to be a part of the response. And so I'd like to turn over now to Reverend Naomi Washington Leaphart, who is going to moderate. We have questions to ask of Reverend Theo Harris, and we have questions you can ask of Reverend Leaphart as well. We have two incredible women here who are committed to justice, and I encourage you to take advantage of this moment and to the, the conversation we can share to make sure that we all end this evening more committed to the justice we came here for. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaddick-Soltis, uh, and thank you, Reverend Dr. Theo Harris, for those um, remarks. Um, I want to invite everybody who's with us to consider asking a question via the Q&A feature that should be towards the bottom of your screen. Um, the chat has been disabled, but you can ask your question via the Q&A feature. So uh, please go ahead and submit your question. I'm going to get us started in a conversation, if that's OK. Um, you know, I, I teach a, a course here in the Center for Peace and Justice um, Education um, on faith-rooted organizing. And so certainly the Poor People's Campaign has been core uh, to our reflection about what it means to be a person of faith and be involved in the movement. Uh, tell us what you think is, is particularly unique about uh, the, a moral movement. Uh, there are lots of uh, secular movements that don't have, that are not grounded in a significant way by faith or moral courage or spirituality. What do you think is, is unique and distinctive and, and therefore strategic and effective about organizing with faith at the core? Well, thank you so much, uh, you know, for that question. And then more largely for the work you're doing um, that is a part of this larger 
uh, moral movement. Um, what the Bible really talks about is, woe to you who legislates evil, who deprives the poor of our rights, making women and homeless children their prey. That's Isaiah 10, right? And we could keep on going from Genesis to Revelation, right? Uh, and that's in Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures, but it's actually pretty universal across um, the religions of the world. In, in this campaign, you know, we have people of faith and people not of faith, um, but who believe in the arc of the universe bending towards justice um, and think that, that when, we, when we talk about things being left or right, Democrat versus Republican, that this language is, as Dr. Barber often says, too puny, right? Too, too, too small um, to actually speak to the what is right versus wrong um, that's going on in our world today. And so I think the Poor People's Campaign, when we started off, and as we are still organized today, uh, we looked at history and we looked at the present and we said, there have never been times in US history when, uh, when those that are most impacted by the injustice that they're trying to solve um, don't band together, come together across all the lines that divide and, and help to lead a movement, but who have to involve moral leaders, spiritual leaders, religious leaders as moral standard bearers, um, talking about, again, what is right and wrong in our society. And so, you know, the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival, we have uh, more than 19 um, national state, uh, uh, sorry, national kind of religious bodies, right? Groups of Baha'i and Buddhists and Muslims and Jews and Christians and um, Catholics and, and people of, of many different uh, traditions. Um, and I think, you know, at, at one, of, one of our gatherings, we often do these mass meetings kind of in the, in the, in the spirit of, in the history of, um, of freedom movements that have come before us. And I remember one, we are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, and we are holding it in, in, in a, a local church and, and folks were, were concerned that not many people were gonna show up um, and said, you know, uh, and, and instead we had, you know, the, the, the congregation brimming with thousands of people. We, we started with a land acknowledgement um, and indigenous folks were, were there. Um, and it was a Friday. And so at one point it came time for a Muslim call to prayer. We had some Pentecostals amongst us. And, and, and what happened in that moment was was the speaking of tongues, the call to prayer, the, the um, indigenous land acknowledgement, all, you know, a Jewish, uh, you know, a Shabbat service, all happening at once. And it wasn't a kind of least common denominator approach to interreligious work together, right? It wasn't like, well, we can agree on, on this. And so we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna rock the boat. We're not gonna, you know, come out there on issues. Um, we're not going to just, you know, hold hands and sing kumbaya. We're, we're, we're actually here, people from all kinds of faith and people, again, not of faith, um, saying, guess what? Uh, we need a moral revolution of values, that, that the way that things are. A, a society that has got comfortable with 700 people dying a day before COVID, let alone what we've seen, the inequities, that, the fissures, of racism, of poverty that have been exposed and deepened in this pandemic, um, that, that that needs, you know, not just a political or economic or social response, it needs a moral response um, that goes back to our, our deepest sacred traditions and to our, our even founding kind of constitutional principles um, uh, of, to become a more perfect union. And so I, I think that that is, is really unique, actually, the, the kind of interreligious and non-religious, but organizing with, with faith, faith that it doesn't have to be this way, faith that we can actually address, fully address these issues, um, and faith that, that, that that's what our calling must be. And, and people are answering that call, and, and I think it's pretty amazing. Wow, thank you. I mean, what you've spoken so eloquently about is 
the access to imagination that we have through faith, right? That, that faith gives us the language, the resources of sacred text, and the courage uh, to speak the truths that, that uh, remain unspoken. So thank you so much. This leads to a uh, question that someone has asked, um, how is the Poor People Campaign working to end educational inequalities in particular in poor communities? What's, what's the vision around that? So it's really um, an important issue, right? I mean, we have, uh, a, again, deep inequities in our society. Um, and, and some of the most glaring you can see is in our education system um, with the defunding of schools, with the, the resegregation of schools. Um, I mean, what we've seen again in COVID is, is just actually how unequal of an educational system, how we really have a system that, that doesn't work and doesn't, you know, kind of provide education to people's fullest um, abilities. And so in, in the Poor People's Campaign, we have this set of demands um, and it's a, it's a full agenda, right? We, we see the connections between voting rights and education and women's rights. And, um, and, and, and we, we basically say, because this seems to be true today and in history that you can't just get one without getting the others. Um, and so, but when it comes to this question of education, you know, we, we, we have some strong policies that are about investing in education, um, about you know stopping the resegregation of schools, um, you know having really important um, funding for HBCUs um, and and other you know other kinds of educational institutions. Uh, we we believe that um, we should eliminate all student debt um, because we can. Um, and and everybody should have you know the kind of access to to education not just from a young age but but through all um, you know we believe in one of the one of the you know bulwark policies of the first poor people's campaign is the Head Start program right um, and and again investing in not just early childhood education but actually. Um, those kind of programs, especially when the community is involved, when 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 poor families are are involved, and that include education and connected to nutrition and connected to housing and connected to other programs, and so so all of those are a part of of the the larger program and set of demands that we have, and um, and we see them as as really important, um, and again. You know, we're we're making sure that that kids aren't living in homelessness, that kids aren't living with inadequate nutrition, um, but we're also making sure that you know that adults, um, you know, are able to to the fact that we don't have a, a military draft anymore, but what we do in the military have is a poverty draft, and that part of the only way that that um, many poor people um, of different races from different parts of the country can actually uh, afford and be able to to get a higher education is by enlisting in the military. Well, it we shouldn't just have, you know, a GI program for 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 military folk. We should we should be able to have a a right to education at all levels. And and so we're we're advocating for that. Um, and again, drawing connections that 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 education and education funding, you know, is a, is a equity issue and is is directly connected to to these other issues. Wow, thank you. Thank you. So Paul asks about um, how we might reach um, people, particularly perhaps people of faith. Uh, Paul says evangelical Christians um, who support a, a political party, a political agenda that can't see, uh, can't hear uh, the conditions that that you've outlined, uh, that were outlined in the video. How how do we reach folk who um, are staunchly opposed to centering the uh, people who are living in poverty um, and moving out of the way and allowing the people to tell us what they need? What do you what do you think? Well. One of the things, you know, as as a biblical scholar, amongst other things, um, that that 
I think of when I hear the word evangelical is what its Greek root actually means, right? Uh, evangelical is evangelion, right? It's, um, it's a Greek word for gospel, for good news. Um, and pretty much everywhere it shows up in our faith texts, um, it's connected to righteousness and justice and lifting the poor up, right? And so according to Luke 4, according to across the, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, across Mark and John, right? Any place where the Evangelion is, 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 is uh, lifted up, it's, it's connected to, to good news and good news to the poor. And what's good news but actually ending poverty, really addressing these issues, right? And so, so again, Dr. Barber, who I want to bring into the space because he's out there taking action on our behalf, you know, has this saying, and he says um, how, how problematic it is to have um, faith leaders praying, P-R-A-Y-ing, um, over political and other religious leaders that are praying, P-R-E-Y-ing, on the poor, on the marginalized, on the on the sick, on the uninsured, and that that this is you know fundamentally um, a real contradiction. Again, if we go back to that inaugural sermon of Jesus's, you know, the Spirit of God is upon me; it's anointed me to bring good news, evangelion, to the Patokos, those who have been made poor by systemic injustice, right? And so, I think when it comes to this question of of, of Christians who um, who have who have instead prayed um, on the poor than praying to a God of justice, uh, you know what we're experiencing is that uh, you know in communities across the country, folks are really open to this message, um, uh, but but that we do have politicians and and other religious leaders who have for too long basically been unchecked and unchallenged. Um, and so that we've started to define that this is what Christianity is when there's this long tradition across our traditions, across our cultures of a kind of um, freedom church of the poor, right? Which is what Dr. King talks about, you know, as he announces the Poor People's Campaign back in 67, um, going into 68. And so um, I I'm an organizer uh, and, and and much of what I've learned as as an organizer is that, you know, you, you go to people and you see if you can win them. And if you can't win them, you move on to the next people that you can win. Um, and then you wait for the next time the bus comes around to see if you can win those folks. And and our experience is that that a lot of times people come on on the second and the third and the fourth rounds. But but that what you, we have to do right now is a revival. A revival is about those that have already woken up, that have already seen that these problems are, are, are big and true and we can do something about it. And so rather than just trying to find people out there that, that don't want to listen, how do we kind of embolden ourselves, come to empower ourselves, come together ourselves and, and, and build this remnant, right? Um, who, who can actually be um, a force for good and for change. Um, and guess what? When you pull that, that together, then you win a lot of other people. And so uh, I, I think what's been really helpful to us in our work and, and the people that have been involved in the Poor People's Campaign, in some of the direct action that we do, are folks across the political spectrum, are people of, of, of white and black and Latino and Asian and indigenous, you know, folks that are older and younger. I mean, a real diversity of folks. And when, when, when they actually tried to categorize like who was participating, for instance, in the North Carolina Forward Together Moral Mondays uh, protests, you know, they found out that a, a large percentage were registered Republicans, a large percentage were independents, a large percentage were Democrats, right? So this is, this is crossing party lines, it is crossing, you know, ideological lines. Um, but folks that are hearing sometimes for a long time, sometimes for the first time that, that it doesn't have to be this way, that, that we have a, a chance to, to, you know, help realize, you know, God's vision of, of kind of a beloved community here on earth. And, and so, so my recommendation would be, uh, you know, uh, let's organize the remnant. Um, and from there, we'll be able to, to build power and grow. Yes, I heard somebody say that little can become much in God's hands. Right, right, right. 
So, so there's something about the power of the remnant. We, I tell my students, we don't need everybody. We don't need everybody. I mean, we need everybody, but we don't need everybody uh, on the front line here uh, to, in order to be successful. Thank you so much for that. So there's been studies done around the sort of mass exodus of folk from organized religious communities. There have been a lot of commentary, particularly about young people's lack of involvement uh, in religious spaces. Uh, in faith community, not that they are a religious or uh, lack spirituality, but not finding home, perhaps, uh, in communities of faith. Someone asks this question, what do you see as the most hopeful sign in the younger generation coming into power, uh, particularly from your vantage point as an organizer who has kind of moral courage at the heart of your work, what's the most hopeful sign? And then the person also asks, what do you think is the biggest barrier uh, to young involvement uh, in, in this movement? Yeah, so I mean, uh, what, what we know again about history um, is that it takes everybody um, and that people, you know, uh, it, people come together kind of intergenerationally. And, and I think we're seeing this, this now. Because what we also know is that always in history, people are saying, but where are the young people? Why are, but uh, I, mean, I remember reading um, The New Abolitionist, one of Howard Zinn's books about um, SNCC and, and the, the role that young people played particularly um, in some of the black freedom struggles. And, uh, and, and he, he said, you know, they were the, the listless generation until, right? I mean, just like that, that throughout history, we, we seem to try to categorize young people as, as not being as active and being apathetic. And, and it's just not true. It, it's just not the case. Uh, you know, what we see all over the country, what we saw in this amazing kind of racial reckoning of, of folks on the streets in protests last summer, what we're seeing with folks, you know, on hunger strike, young people on hunger strike because they're trying to protect the climate. What we're seeing, you know, with, with young immigrants saying, you know, don't just get protections for me, all 11, un, all 11 million undocumented immigrants, right? What we're seeing, you know, with the fight for 15 low wage workers, it's young people, that's, that's who's leading that, right? And so all across the country, you have beautiful examples of impacted young people who are not waiting for others to kind of come and do the work, um, but who are forging relationships across all kinds of barriers, but playing real leadership, real powerful roles. Um, and so to me, that's incredibly hopeful. I mean, just to see actually, across different issues, across different geographies, across different kind of demographics, racial, ethnic graphic de demographics, you have young people, especially, you know, kind of poor and low income young people um, who are out there like leading the charge um, and just not taking no for an answer. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's amazing. I mean, and that's what it's gonna take. Um, uh, and I think, then when you talk about this question of, of barriers, I mean, sometimes I really think it's these, these tired and kind of stereotypes and false narratives about people being apathetic and about um, uh, also just kind of blaming each of us for the problems that society has. I mean, I, I, you know, whether it's poor people or black people or Latino people or immigrants or young people, um, I mean, all of the blame that gets cast on, on on, on folks um, and all the attempts to kind of have us fight each other um, and feed us this kind of lie that, that there isn't enough or this is as good as it gets or we can't really make a change. And if, if we got power, it would corrupt. If we got absolute power, it would corrupt absolutely, right? And, and I sometimes think that, that some of those are some of the biggest barriers is this, this false narrative that's out there that, that that has become hegemonic, but it, it does, it covers up the truth because the truth is that people are out there, especially young people are out there fighting every day and saying, you know, in the words of one of the Fight for 15 workers that I'm inspired daily by from Appalachian, Virginia, 
Uh, his name is Nick Smith, and he says, our backs are against the wall, and all we can do is push, right? And and there he and so many others are, pushing, pushing, pushing. And and so, you know, I I find that incredibly hopeful. Even the barrier of this kind of false narrative, because people are are, are busting through it. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, are there two or three uh, issues that are that have the most strategic significance for the campaign? I mean, there's so much, and you've already talked about how these systems of oppression cooperate and collaborate, right? So there's uh, there's so much to address. What are the one or two or three strategic issues, critical issues um, that are significant to the campaign right now? So this uh, past summer, um, I mean, so we, we say that there's five interlocking injustices and that's how we formed and we're, we're, we're focused on that we, that we have to take on systemic racism and poverty, um, ecological devastation, militarism, and this false narrative, right? But, but this summer, we, we launched a kind of season of action that we're, we're still in. It's part of the reason Dr. Barber isn't here with us this evening, right? Um, because we have a historic moment in our country um, to kind of push forward and, and try to um, win some of the things, the demands that people out in the community have been have talking about. And so, so in particular, we've been trying to kind of highlight the connection between defending our democracy by expanding and protecting our voting rights um, with um, concerns and issues around especially economic justice, whether it's living wages, whether it's some kind of um, you know, things like the child tax credit, um, uh, you know, other other programs of social uplift. And so so we never kind of say that we're going to boil down our program and our agenda to only a couple of issues. But but we've been really trying to hit hard at this intersection of of voting rights, because, um, again, what happens when when I mean, we're, we're right now witnessing the biggest assault on voting rights. Um, that the country has seen since right after the Civil War, right? Um, uh, we have fewer voting rights than we did um, uh, right when they passed the Voting Rights Act um, in 65. And, and now since 2021, about 400 um, voter suppression uh, bills have been introduced to, into 49 states, all states except for Vermont. Um, uh, and and we have yet to see actually to see actually Congress take sufficient action, um, both on the voting rights restoration and on expanding um, voting rights um, with the For the People Act or the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, and so, so we've been spending a bunch of time and attention on when basically elected officials get smuggled in because of voter suppression, because of racist voter suppression. Um, uh, what happens is that those same people then pass policies that hurt the poor of all races, you know, hurt immigrants, hurt indigenous and native people, hurt women, um, hurt, hurt LGBTQIA folks. And so, so we're trying to show, especially the reason that we have to, you know, expand and protect voting rights. We have to, you know, promote economic justice. We have to raise our, our wages to a living wage. Um, and that we have to, you know, uh, you know, in this moment, actually, and the filibuster so that we can get health care and all of these things that that um, right now, the people in a vast majority of people want, um, but are still um, being denied. And so, so, so I would say, you know, all of that. And so, so today, because this was another day, yesterday, we were doing an action in DC, you know, on Sunday, we were in action in West Virginia, you know, continuing to kind of put the pressure on the fact that we can't compromise um, uh, on uh, the lives of poor and low-income people and essential workers and those without health care and, and those without dental insurance and paid sick leave and all of these issues. And so uh, trying to show the connections of all of those, especially between defending the democracy and, you know, investing um, in, in the people. Mm, thank you. Speak, speaking of compromise and, and navigating compromise or refusing to compromise, uh, Mark has a question. How do we handle the inevitable compromising that happens in the legislative process? You know, you you spark a vision, you get really ambitious, and then what you end up with is, you know, perhaps a fraction of what 
of what you saw in that vision? So it makes me think a little bit about um, what movements are. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I love to quote Reverend Dr. King. Um, and he talked about, you know, power for poor people will really mean having the assertiveness, the aggressiveness, uh, and the togetherness to make the power structures of the nation say yes, when they may be desirous of saying no. Um, and I think it, it kind of pushes back against this whole idea of compromise, right? Because um, because it, it says like, how do we kind of build a compelling power um, that that means that 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 our politicians don't compromise um, the lives and livelihoods of the people? I mean, if we talk about something like living wages, um, if we talk about things like voting rights, if we talk about health care, uh, you know people in vast majorities support these kinds of programs right now. I mean, in West Virginia, for instance, where Senator Manchin is talking all this talk about compromise, you know, 80% of people, not just Democrats, but Republicans, independents, and Democrats, 80% believe in expanding voting rights. And, and a similar number um, percentage agree in raising the wages and in, you know, investing in, in paid sick leave and all of these kind of uh, programs that are that are right now on the chopping block, and um, and so, you know, one of the questions we've been posing is, well, why is it that the military and that Wall Street and corporations, you know, are never told that they have to compromise, that they have to choose, um, that there isn't enough resources there, right? Um, you know, we've been talking about this three point five trillion, and then now, you know, less than two trillion bill, right? Um, well, the United States has spent $21 trillion on basically militarism, on wars, on uh, militarizing the border, militarizing our communities since 9-11, $21 trillion, right? So $3.5 trillion over 10 years is just pennies compared, right? It's just pennies. And so, so on some level, why do we have to have this conversation about compromise? Um, Again, we're we're not asking the military to the border, you know, enforcement to, to compromise. We're we're always asking it, especially of the least of us, right? Especially, um, but but the power of a movement is that you build that compelling power. Um, and so I think about, for instance, and I, I'm sorry to go on so long, but but about the Montgomery bus boycott um, and the demands of that of that movement. Uh, you know, action and activity. Um, and at the beginning of that boycott, um, when folks are, are, are trying to figure out, the, the demands of it are, are not actually nearly as radical as the wins are um, by the end of that boycott. The demands are about integrating, um, hiring more black drivers, making more stops in black communities, and, uh, you know, not desegregating the buses, but just letting black people fill up until white people are on, right? I mean, it, it's really not, it's not about the complete um, desegregation of buses, um, but what happens because of the compelling power of the, the people of Montgomery, um, you know, led by the likes of, of the Women's Political Council um, uh, are able to win is, is demands that are not compromises, they're bigger than what people ask for. And so, what if, what if we imagine that? What if we imagine that that movement means uh, building uh, the power, a compelling power to make the power structure say yes when they may be desirous of saying no? Thank you. You know, th this, this conversation about compromise that we're having now and the conversation we were having about the participation and leadership of young people remind me of a song we sang in my church community growing up it said whose report shall we believe right uh, whose report are we believing about the state of things on the ground the state of things in neighborhoods the the minds and hearts of young people right and what i love about the poor people's campaign is it um it essentially passes the mic uh we we believe the report of the people 
Um, and, and I love that about the Poor People's Campaign and, and your work. Tell Can you about, share that with us? Oh, this, <laughs> just asking. Uh, perhaps, perhaps at the end, we can all send all right. a number all <laughs> together. Right. <laughs> um, so, so uh, 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 someone who is listening and watching uh, t tonight sees your bookshelf behind you um, and uh, is asking this question. Tell us about the significance of the texts that are on your shelf and what messages they are collectively sending us. So a lot of the books that are behind me actually are books of, from the movement. Um, the one I have on most display is, is the, my, my most recent book. It's called We Cry Justice, Reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. And it's a kind of a devotional that, that talks about, you know, the stories of our lives of poor people organizing today and, and, and also the kind of sacred stories of, of poor people organizing throughout our sacred texts. Um, and, um, but then there's other, other, other books there that are, um, again, you know, uh, some of Dr. Barber's books are talking about a third reconstruction, you know, um, uh, other, other folks that are talking about, you know, uh, stopping the war on the poor and, and, and so many of the issues that are uh, about, uh, about the, the work that we're trying to do. And, you know, from, from a perspective that is, um, you know, that, that again, is international, is from lots of different kinds of voices, um, but again, is trying to center um, those that are most impacted. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's there's models for how uh, how we can do debt relief, and 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 there's a book about the Freedom Church of the Poor, right? Um, which again was this concept that 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 has run throughout history from some of the abolitionist movement. Um, and then again, Dr. King talks about it um, when he's imagining what a poor people's campaign of uniting poor people across geography, across race, into what he calls an intergenerational nonviolent um, army or freedom church of the of the poor. And um, and so I, I think many of those titles are, 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 are again, stories from the movement of, of what it looks like to to kind of come together and organize together and put forward a vision that that we can indeed kind of overcome and 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 do better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the things that we talk a lot about in this faith rooted organizing class is um, the extent to which um, students feel invited to dedicate their whole lives to this work you know, professionally, vocationally, in terms of volunteer, right? And we talk about the costs um, and, you know, how to make this work um, sustainable, not just for the movement purpose, right, purposes, but so that we can stay alive, right? What would you say is the role of joy and rest and pleasure uh, in your work, if you could share any practices that would be helpful to us as we uh, try to, to to participate in this kind of work, which can be, you know, just emotionally exhausting and and thankless. Um, talk to us about joy and rest and pleasure. So when I was um, a college student in Philadelphia, I was involved with um, welfare rights organizing and homeless organizing and we had a close relationship to a, a drug recovery program in North Philly um, that had the saying that in order to fully recover, we must recover the society that has made us sick. Um, and I just, it really just made so much sense to me um, uh, that, that, that part of actually self-care, part of joy and rest is actually also doing this work, but it also means that we, we, we take care of ourselves as we heal the world. Um, I think, again, it, it could be because I'm a Bible study, a studies person, um, but, you know, I, uh, the kind of concept of Jubilee or the concept of Sabbath is, is really a brilliant one um, for this question of, like, how do we sustain ourselves? Because our scriptures are so clear um, that this release, this rest, you know, um, is actually the work of justice, um, 
uh, and and that rest and that that joy is is connected to making sure that people are are making enough money and and have everything that they need to thrive, not just barely survive. Um, but it but it's it's a part of a a larger vision. Um, and I, I come out of some human rights organizing and, you know, there's this universal declaration of human rights and um, Article 23 is about the right to a job at a living wage. Article 25 is about, you know, the right to an adequate standard of living. Right, 20, Article 26 is about education. But, but right there is Article 24. Um, that's r- the right to leisure the right to, to rest, right? And it's, it's there with these other rights. Um, and it says, you know, as a human being, we all have the right um, to, to care for ourselves, to care for our communities, but as we struggle to make sure that everyone um, has a good life. And, and I think it doesn't mean pitting me against other people or, or I have to have mine over here so that um, to the exclusion of someone over there, it's, it's, it's a, it's a vision that says that, you know, that, that is possible and that it's what God desires of us. And it's what, you know, we desire for each other. Uh, You know how I feel about Jubilee. Listen, um, you know, what if rest is the goal? Rest is the destination. That's right. Rest is the destination. Thank you so much for that. Here's another question. What would you say to a student of privilege who thinks that one step forward for the poor is one step back for people of privilege? That we're living in a world of abundance. And so it's not that there's uh, just one bone we all got to fight over. Um, but that there's a whole bunch of bones back there that that could be distributed in a way that everybody would have not just enough, but but more than we need. And it could be sustainable, right? I mean, this country throws away more food than it takes to feed, not just everyone that's hungry in this country, but around the whole world, right? We have more abandoned, in, in some cities, I'm not sure if this is still true in Philadelphia, but at one point it was, we have basically five abandoned housing units for every homeless person, right? So, so it's not that like, that there isn't enough. It's not that like, if I get this, I'm gonna deny you this. It's that right now, the way that stuff is organized means that, that a very select greedy few has everything and, and everyone else has to fight over nothing. But it doesn't have to be that way. And, 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 and someone coming forward with you know, a demand for justice, um, uh, you can lock arms with them and you can talk about your demand for justice for them and for yourself at the same time. And so one of the things that I think about the word privilege is that I think it sometimes gets in the way. Um, I really believe that education, that adequate housing, that wonderful food, that these are rights. They're not privileges. And so we want everybody to have them. So I don't want to also be in a situation where if I have something I think I have to give up so that someone else doesn't, I, I, we should, we should we got to be balanced. We got to be sustainable. Um, it doesn't mean that all of us are going to go out and, you know, have a million TVs and a million cars and, you know, but, but we could have a right to, to, to living decent lives. Um, and that that doesn't have to infringe on someone else's. Um, and that it's, it's only because we've been fed this lie of scarcity we've, we've been, we've been told that we all can't have it. You got to rob Peter to pay Paul. Well, guess what? That, that, that is, is actually just a lie. The only scarcity we have is a scarcity of, as Dr. Barbara says, conscience, um, or political will to change it. Right. Um, and, and so we can all be involved in, in changing that. Um, and, and then we don't got to feel bad that we have something and someone doesn't. But we also don't have to think that it's going to be taken away from us for someone else to get it. Um, both both directions um, aren't the case. The, the The reality is is that that we 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 can we can have our cake and eat it too. I love that. I mean, you know, we talk in the classroom about these lies, these mythologies that we have believed 
um, that there isn't enough, um, that time is running out. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just love this reorientation toward abundance, right? Um, uh, here's, here's perhaps the final couple of questions because I'm, I'm, I'm watching the time. Um, do you know what the action was that Re Reverend Barber was participating in today? Is it part of a series of actions you mentioned um, having been in, in, I think you said Virginia and DC. Um, how can we engage, someone asks, in the action that Reverend Barber is engaged in right now? Yeah, so what, what I know um, was that there were folks in Washington, D.C. today that were um, calling out the, the wrongness, the immorality of pu pulling the paid sick leave from the Build Back Better legislation. And so, um, there, uh, uh, again, I don't know a lot of the details just because, um, but, but I think the way to be engaged in this action and and all of these other actions, I mean, I think there's many, but I would encourage everybody here to, to join the Poor People's Campaign. Um, we send out text alerts, we send out emails, um, and uh, we are engaged in, in regular kind of direct action and, and also call-ins. You know, right now we're, we've been trying to have um, put some real pressure on, on the House, on the Senate to, to make sure that, that we really can have as full of a, of a bill as, as poor and low income people need as, as, as every American needs, um, uh, as our, our climate needs. Um, and so, you know, a number of things have been, uh, taken out recently. And so people have been, I'm trying to make sure that it, that, 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 that isn't the case. And so, um, again, please join us and, and also join us when we, when we convene and converge on DC um, this coming June, we have a lot of organizing to do, but we really believe that that we can have a, a, a powerful declaration um, by having just thousands of people out um, uh, in DC, making sure that our voices are heard. Thank you. Any Anything you haven't had a chance to speak to, anything that's on your heart that you wanna share, you wanna make sure we hear before we before we leave tonight? It's a good question. I mean, again, I, I really, movements begin because people like the folks that are gathered here, like the students and staff and faculty of Villanova, like the people of Philadelphia and the outlying areas, decide that 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 we have a role to play and, and that um, that it doesn't have to be this way and that, um, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, and there is a lot of really beautiful, powerful work happening. Um, and I'm sure people are already really involved. Um, and I, I hope you'll, you'll join us or continue to, to join us and many others. You know, we need, in this moment, we need a lot of flowers to bloom, right? So it's, it's, we need us all, but we need to also be able to kind of come out of our silos and be together. Um, and, and, and make a kind of powerful movement. And I, I see one and I think it's very hopeful, um, but we, we have our work cut out for us still. Thank you so, 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 so much um, for these extraordinary, this extraordinary conversation um, and reflection on your work. We again, celebrate you and your leadership with Dr. Barber and all of the folk who are involved all over the country in the Poor People's Campaign. Every Poor People's Campaign gathering I've been to, we have done lots of singing. That's right. So uh, Reverend Dr. Liz is gonna join me in singing, <laughs> singing a song uh, from the movement as kind of a, 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 a sending, a blessing, a benediction uh, for we who believe in freedom. That's not what I'm gonna sing, but uh, uh, so thank you again, thank you to uh, the Center for Peace and Justice Education. Thank you for uh, your leadership and this honor. Thank you to Father Kevin and folks over in uh, Mission and Ministry. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, why don't we say, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. We have been so inspired um, and so revived by this conversation. I think that's a good way to go out. Uh, tonight, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, 
I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let injustice turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let injustice turn me around. We're gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Yes, thank you to Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris and Reverend Barber. In his absence, we, we do pray that he is safe uh, wherever he is um, and, and that he, he and you can find time to rest and experience joy in the midst of all of this work. Uh, Dr. Catherine, do you, are we, you want to come on and say some final closing goodbyes? Or no, okay. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us tonight and um, stay tuned to the Center for Peace uh, and Justice Education for the remainder events we'll be having this semester. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Be well.